series in this uh, small epistle and having a fun time. We're still in chapter one. I believe this is lesson number five. And I remember listening to my father teach and he would be on lesson seven or eight or five or six in the first chapter. You're like, oh, this is going to be a long drawn out lesson. So I'll try not to do that. That is in the back of my mind. You wonder where you stop with uh, what you put out, but uh, we, we will get through. Hopefully you get, get something out of it that can feed you, strengthen you. And uh, that's what I want it to be. I'm not here to take up wasted time. I want it to be something that's productive out of God's word and then mindful of our time and what we have today. I'm glad you're here tonight and I know it is a special commitment a lot of times for the evening services. You have a lot of, a lot of stuff going on, schedules and stuff, but I thank you for that. I know God likes the faithfulness and uh, we understand that in this day and age there's a lot that can grasp and take your time, but I thank you for being faithful to Wednesday evening. If you have your Bibles, Philippians chapter 1, and I want you to notice I'm going to, we, we left off in chapter 10 last Wednesday evening, but I want to say some things about chapter, uh, I'm sorry, chapter, verse 10, we left off in verse 10, and then verse 11, I didn't really make our comments, and I wanted to dwell there, there's a lot in verse 11, and then we will look at verses 12 through 18. If uh, we have the time tonight, I still want to be mindful of the, uh, of the juniors, those that want to do sword drill tonight. Now, we, we generally take this along in our studies, and I didn't do it last Wednesday night, and I was asked the reason, why? Why didn't you do it? Sometimes it slips my mind, as names do and dates, as you can tell very, very easily. But tonight, if you want to do sword drills, raise your swords, and we'll see who we have all right, we have three, we have four. Anybody else? Okay, so we have four, four or five there. We, we have five. All right, so I think we can do that. And so we will take right off here with that. And so juniors, if you have your Bibles, uh, your verse that you're going to go to is Romans chapter 3, verse 23. Romans three twenty-three. And when you find it, stand. And I'm looking for the first word, Romans three twenty-three. All right, we had Miss Naomi in the back. What's that first word there? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All right, so that's our first verse, and uh, we always break it down. Boy, I, I don't know why I do. So why do you do that? It's just how it goes. And so, so the girls are one, and so we'll see what the boys can keep up tonight. All right, Philippians chapter 1, and notice with me verse number 9, and uh, we'll read into verse 11. It says here, And in this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge, in all judgment, that ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. Okay, we'll start into some of this uh, looking at, we looked at uh, our priority. When he says things that are excellent, he's not looking at things that are secondary in your life. He wants you to approve or to do uh, or to be thinking about things that are excellent in your Christian life. And we always say, we'll say this, and it probably is in my notes somewhere, uh, God first, family second, ministry third. If you get that, that natural godly uh, order you, you will find that your relationships won't work right, your life won't work well, and sometimes you can get that uh, switched up, and uh, you'll think, what is going on? Then it hits you, like, I don't have God first in my life. You say, well, what is God? The things of, the things of God is your relationship with God. That would be your prayer life, your Bible studying, your Bible reading time, uh, the works of God. What, what is God involved in? Well, he's involved in church. He's involved in ministry. That's our, those are God things. Second is going to be your family. If you have a family, you want to work and make sure that your family is ministered to physically, emotionally, spiritually. And then you begin to look at the third thing, which is going to be ministry. And the thought process, if you don't have a good relationship with your Savior, you're not going to have a good relationship in your family. And if you don't have a good relationship in your family, you're definitely not going to have healthy relationships in ministry. And so they build upon one another, and you don't want to get that priority uh, switched. And we teach this in depth, even more depth, in when you're dealing with uh, people who work in ministry. 
preachers, teachers, and so you'll see more of that thrust in those types of classes or lessons that we'll teach on. We'll teach a little bit heavier in these areas, all right? Uh, you can't minister unless you're able to minister to your family. So you'll have a lot of times a pastor, young pastor, or even old, older pastor, I've seen they get so wrapped up in ministry, that's all they think about, that's all that's in their heart and mind. And you think they're doing something for God, it's got to be right. But then the family suffers, the relationship, maybe the marriage, or maybe the children's relationship with the parents. And it falls, begins to fragment. And you'll see the after effect or the fruit of it through the children and through the marriage. It'll be weak. And you'll say, wow, what happened? Well, the, that ministry, he failed to minister to his family first. And so uh, you say, well, why is it in that order? Why is it God first, family second? It's how God instituted and constituted and provisioned those. He was for God first, your relationship. He constituted the marriage and the home and the family. And because of sin and because of the way the world has went, uh, opposite of God or void of God, you have ministry. God constitutes ministry. All right, and so that's kind of the breakdown. That's what he's saying here to, to the Philippians. He's saying, look, I want you to approve the things that are excellent in verse 10, that ye may be sincere and without offense uh, till the day of Christ. That's until God calls us home. And so now we move to verse 11. So let's break verse 11 down before we get into our main portion of our, our lesson tonight. Watch verse 11. It says, being filled with the fruits of, say it with me, righteousness which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. Now we'll read that again and break it down, but in verse 11, Paul is concerned for the abundance of the fruit of righteousness in the believer's life. All right, so the fruits of righteousness. Now the fruits of righteousness is an Old Testament, uh, it's an Old Testament expression that has to do with the fulfilling of all of the requirements of the law. All right, so righteousness was to be the product of the law because the law revealed the righteousness uh, and holiness of God. But, but the, this righteousness now, if we read here, this righteousness, it's, it's not, uh, it's not uh, this righteousness which he prays here does not come from the law. You say, how do you know that? Well, Paul says in, in Romans chapter 8 verse 4, which he had written before Philippians, it, it says this in verse 4, the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk uh, after, not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So he, he's telling these believers here when he says this, the fruits of righteousness, he's not saying the Old Testament law. He's saying, look, the fruits of righteousness should be and come forth out of your life. God begins to work and add these fruits of righteousness in your life. So uh, these fruits are produced by Jesus Christ. He's saying that living is Christ. The fruits of righteousness are the product of of the life of Christ in the child of God. Paul desires that Christ, the living one, may manifest his life in the lives of these believers here in Philippians or Philippi. And he says this, that Christ's righteousness will be produced in them. All right. So this righteousness is also, if you look at verse 11 with me again, so he says, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which is by Jesus Christ. Uh, and here's what I think of. I think of Galatians 2.20. And that verse says, uh, for I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, uh, but Christ liveth in me. Uh, in the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This is what Paul is speaking of here. And so we see that uh, this righteousness, it also, it says, unto the glory and praise of God. I'm reminded of Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16. Uh, it says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. And so he's definitely speaking to Christians, those that have been saved. So Paul is assured of the salvation of these saints. That's not what he, he's not talking about salvation. He's also satisfied with their growth, but he realizes that they have not yet attained that for which they have been set apart by God to do or, or to produce. And so he prays that they might be characterized by the love of God, that they may approve not the secondary things, but the primary things, 
and that they might be uh, that there might be no offense before God or before men in order that God be glorified in their lives. So this is this is what Paul is laying out. He's teaching. You say, well, how, how does this apply to me? Well, I simply, when I get to that part, let's ask it questions. And here's the questions that I have. Is your life or my life characterized by the love of Christ? Or is it the love that I have for my job, the love that I have for my hobbies, the love that I have for my talents, the love that I have for my ability? You can put a lot of stuff before God that is healthy. It's not wrong. It is wrong to put it before God, though. And so the first question that can begin for this, this, this portion of Scripture to apply to us spiritually is your life characterized by the love of Christ? Secondly, second question, is your life devoted to the things of superior value, a more excellent, things that are excellent, your priority, God first, family second, ministry third? And so we see this. Thirdly, we would ask this question to begin to look at application for us. Is your life without reproach before God and man? Say, ooh, that might be a little bit harder. And it can be, but it's good questions. And this is what he's saying or trying to teach here to the Philippians. And then here we have, fourthly, is your life showing the fruit of righteousness? And is it bringing glory to God? Or is it bringing glory to self or to an organization or to something else that is once your glory rather than God? So here it's very important. The verse, verse 11, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. Now let's move into verse 12 and look at verse 12 with me. And he says this, but I would ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. Let's read verse 13 uh, through 14. He says, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. So that's verse 14. Let me say this. One of the reasons Paul wrote this letter, and we're just catching the first part of it here in chapter 1, was to comfort the Philippian church about his situation, uh, their concern of his situation in jail. He was in jail at this time. You find that, um, well, let's go to Matthew. I I quoted Matthew chapter 5, but there's another verse in Matthew. If you would take your Bible and turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, and Paul begins to, the lesson for tonight is Paul's understanding of the brethren, and he breaks this down. And we're going to look at three things tonight if we have the time. The first one's going to be, number one, persecution, and you'll find that in verses 12 through 14. The second thing is you're going to find in verses 15 through 17 is problems, and he's going to categorize these problems or look at them, and we'll expound upon them, and then Thirdly, we're going to look at patience, and you'll find it in verse 18. All right, and so those are kind of roughly the outline for tonight. But number one, let's deal with this. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 45, if you're looking or have turned with me, notice with me verse 45, and it says that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain unto the just and on the unjust. Uh, These Christians here at Philippi, especially this church, were concerned with the Apostle Paul and what was happening to him. And he says, look, this is going, God, it rains on the just as well as the unjust. And I think I'm going to look at a verse here in Romans. But God is, uh, God is not, when it comes to this kind of stuff, you're, you, whether you're saved or lost, you're going to go through things in your life. Now, the Apostle Paul was a saved man. He was, he was ministering the best way he knew how, as God had given him the ability to. And so he begins to teach the Philippians as he goes through some of these trials and difficulties in his life. So that's Matthew chapter 5, verse 45. I'll give you another one that parallels with this. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. I think I've already quoted one out of Romans or read one. Romans chapter 8. And this is dealing with how God... Uh, will work. Romans chapter 8 and verse 28. Get over there. He says this, 
And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. So you say, man, I'm going through a trial, a struggle and a half. Listen, if you are a saved child of God, God is not thinking, well, I'll, I'll get a hold of him later. I'll look into his problems here in a few minutes or a day or so or next month or next week. It isn't working that way. God is watching. God knows every detail that you and I go through, especially as his children, let alone as a lost person. You say that you think God deals with lost people? I know he does. The Bible said he draws them. The Holy Spirit will draw them to him. And God is not willing that any should perish. I, I quote that a lot because that is one of the wills that you and I should know as children of God. God's not willing that any should perish. So we'll get to thinking sometime. I know the world thinks this. Well, God doesn't care. He allows this to go on, that to go on. Look, if, if you didn't go through anything, how would you expect to learn or to grow? You say, well, I want to learn the easy way. Sometimes learning the easy way is not the best way. God might have to take you through something pretty deep and pretty hard for you to get and understand to be able to teach it to somebody else that you're going to run across that is going to go through the same thing you went through or of a like trial. So God, God teaches that way, and sometimes it leaves its... It's Mark <laughs> on your life and on my life. And uh, so that's part of it. And this is what was going on. Paul's like, look, listen to, listen to what's going on here. So uh, back in our text here, uh, for the Christians in Philippi, persecution was not just something that they read about. It was a daily, a daily reality for them. In particular, they lived with a concern for the Apostle Paul's in prison in Rome. And we see the persecution. So as we read verse 12, this is what he's saying. What looks bad from a human perspective is often part of God's bigger plan that we will not have a full understanding until we get in, into heaven. There'll be things that you'll, you'll see go, people go through or take part in or or realize what's happening or what's happened, but you won't fully understand why, why it happened. You know, some of the hard stuff for me is when you see a young child, God takes a young child home to heaven. See, why did God do that? What about the family and, and the pain and, and, man, everything that that goes through and then maybe how that child left this world and went to heaven? But we, we, that's from a human perspective, and it's hard. Our heart is you know soft our mind just is begin to to whirl because why 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 and you, you try to rationalize that and sometimes it's not there you don't know why but when you begin to think about how god looks at something god don't look at it he says it's better at the day of one's the saint the the death of a saint is better than the day of one's birth it's what scripture says and you're like wow now I know for a fact human thinking is diametrically opposed to the way God looks at things. So God looks at it. He moved one person from, from earth in time into eternity pretty easy. And he doesn't have that thought. He knows what you're thinking. He knows what you're feeling. But his plan is far superior. He doesn't, well, I'm going to go with an insuperior plan. No, he's going to go with his plan, which is perfect. And I'm not trying to rationalize anything. here. I'm just saying God does not look... Uh, at things the way humans look at it, okay? So this per perception, we're going to look at this perception in verse 12, this perception, let's read it again. But, but I would, ye should understand, I'm back in Philippians chapter 1, verse 12, brethren, that the things which happen unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. Paul was looking at it, it's like, look, okay, I, I know I'm in jail, I know there's a lot of persecution going on, but look, what, look at the positive side of this. He wasn't a, a, a positive thinker, but look at it. The gospel was being spread. When they were being persecuted, they were going out and they were taking the gospel with them. The gospel, he said, the furtherance of the gospel. That's what Christ wanted. That's what God wanted. Remember what he commanded in Matthew chapter 20, verse 19, go ye therefore into all the world. And so sometimes persecution has to come to move, move them out. I've seen churches get into a squabble, good, strong church. You think, what happened? Well, Satan's always involved in squabbles and struggles. But what happens is other people go out of that church into ministry. If they don't go into ministry, something else going on. But a lot of times it would go out into other ministry. Other churches would start, other missionaries would go, uh, uh, and you would see God balance it back out and the gospel be spread out. 
That can happen. And uh, sometimes we overlook God working. It's called perception. And we see that Paul had a biblical perception of this. So let's look at the progress as well. And the progress he was saying, was speaking of, he said, progress. What's progress? There's no progress in verse 12. Well, but I would ye should understand. This is why we're talking our way through this to understand that, look, our our outlook could be wrong. Our perception could be wrong here. He says, you need to understand, brethren. So a brethren, he wants the brethren to see a lost person, somebody that doesn't perceive the, the, the spiritual things is going to struggle big time with this. They're going to say, this is crazy. But a saved person that has the Spirit of God is going to say, okay, God could be working here. I might be missing something here. He said, I, he said you should understand, the brethren, that these things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel uh, and through others, through persecution. Look at verse 13. So that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. That's what he's saying. He said, now in the palace, the rich and the high and mighty and the blue bloods here, I am witnessing to them. He was was attached to a guard. There was a guard that watched him day and night. He began to witness them. He's writing things down like this epistle. There's people coming to him and he's sharing the gospel or what God had revealed to him. And so the, the palace is being saturated with the gospel. All right, and so he says here in verse thirteen, that's in the palace and in other places. Now, what? So that's through uh, persecution. This is happening. Now, watch verse fourteen. Uh, this is uh, through others. And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. So because Paul is gone, he's in a location, and he's not going to leave that location. He's he's imprisoned. And so because he's absent, somebody else has to stand up and begin to continue on with the ministry. And a lot of the brethren that might have not have a lot of boldness to stand up and to preach or to teach or to move on with ministry, they're doing that. That's what verse 14 is. That's through others. So this progress is through persecution, number one. Number two, through others. All right, let's look verse 15. We're going to see the problems. Now he's going to get into the problems. You say it was... Uh, Wherever Paul went, and let me say this, anywhere you go with the gospel, with a testimony, you wouldn't have to say a word. As a Christian, act right, live right, be right. As a child of God, conduct yourself right. And people automatically, you're odd, because people normally don't act like that. There's been people I've, I've worked around indirectly, not every day but maybe new of us or new of our business. Uh, and, and, and it had been 10 years later. So I knew, I knew. And then we would talk. And he said, I knew you guys were Christians. And he had never said a word to him, didn't know who he was. But they made a point that I knew you guys were different. I knew you were Christians. And you say, why? It's not, it's just how you conduct yourself. You don't lie, cheat, steal, and, and run with the people that do or whatever, how that goes. Uh, and so you, you, this is what Paul is saying. But there's going to be problems there's always problems. And so you say, man, I haven't said nothing. I just come into church or just started reading my Bible, started praying. And it's like everything begins to fall apart. Uh, people begin to ask questions. And the, what is going on here? Well, there are problems. And you find this in the ministry. And this is Paul. is not exempt. Watch this. Problems. Watch verse 15. Now he says, in some indeed preach Christ even of envy, one, and strife, two, and some also of Goodwill. All right, now verse 16. The one, the one preach Christ of contention, third, not sincerely, fourth, supposing to add affliction to my bonds. Okay, he's, let's read all, let's read verse 17. Uh, and he says here, but the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. Okay, so he's giving you kind of the two sides of the coins here. Let's look at the problems. I've broken it down like this. The problems of motives. This is what I am read here, the motives. Sometimes we see people do things that concern us. I've realized, come to know, I'm not, as I say before, don't worry about what dad says, but not the sharpest knife in the drawer, but I'm, I'll be 46 this year and I've lived just enough to know that just because somebody is doing something good, doesn't mean that their intentions are good. I'm not the judge of, well, I get to decide, well, if their intentions are right. No, 
I look at it like this. Give it time. Pray for them in the, in the condition and understanding that they are doing good. But because we're humans, <laughs> and you know how humans are, know how brethren and Christians can be towards one another, you, time generally tells on what type of fruit it really is. And so God is the ultimate judge of that. You go on, but you, you'll learn something, and Paul knew this. You say, well, you're not supposed to know that. Paul's writing about it here, and he's warning the Philippians, and he wanted some balance in the thing as, as it unfolds, as we read. So um, I don't buy that either. Well, you shouldn't worry about it. You should. You should be wise. You should understand this about the ministry and about problems. Not everybody that does something good has good intentions. Okay, so here we see this, and so we see, he says, number one, one preaches for envy and strife. I, I have seen, and heard and seen, and been around preachers or teachers, ministers, who would do it and in, in be in the mode of envy and in strife. Uh, and you say, well, how do you know? Well, number one, they, they say that. They have to get, I've heard preachers say, I have to get angry to preach. Thinking, you have to get angry to preach. Wow. I would think that would be the farthest thing from your mind or heart if you're going to get up in front of people and say something from the word of God. Deliver something that should be honest, true, with long-suffering and patience. And you say, you've got to get worked up in the flesh to deliver it at a dynamic, i got to think angry things or be angry or upset with something. I don't think that is, that's not spiritually healthy. Uh, and that's not how the Bible lays out preaching or teaching. But he says, one preaching for envy and strife. He identifies it as envy. I'm doing this because I'm envy of somebody else or another preacher or teacher. Or I'm envy of this, so I'm going to do it because I think I can do it better or because they're doing it. The other one is because of strife. I like contention. Do you know there's people who are naturally bent on contention? The first guy I can think of, and I've said guy, first thing I can think of is Satan. I'm reading a book right now. It's called uh, uh, Your Adversary, Satan. It's written by J. Dwight Pentecost. It's, in a, it's, a, it's a small book, and it's an unbelievable book. It's, I'm, I, I'm, I'm enjoying it. And the po- copy I have is falling apart. Literally, every time I open it, it's crumbling. It's on me, and it's, it's, it's uh, falling apart. But I think I'm going to get another one here. It's not an expensive one. But uh, as you begin to study about his attributes, he's definitely contentious. He was contentious with God. And it was through pride. That's Pride, that's how contention starts, through pride. All right, so he says envy and strife, strife, being strifeful. Uh, And so we see, secondly, one preaches for goodwill. There are people who will preach for goodwill, to be those who have good intentions and want to do things above board and honestly and, and don't preach or teach or minister through envy or strife. I've been with people on the street who have, uh, who have an I call it an edge, and they'll, they'll do some crazy things. It's not like you're with them and you know, you're talking normal. You get on the street passing out tricks or they're going to deal with people. And all of a sudden they have an attitude. You are worried. I'm thinking, what is going on? I wouldn't listen to you. I, I'd, walk, I'd walk 10 miles around you. And they think, well, that's it. They either receive it or reject it. I'll see them at the judgment. Thinking nobody's going to buy anything that you're saying. You have the wrong spirit, the wrong motive, the wrong thrust. And so here it's not godly, but there are some who do it out of goodwill. And this is what Paul wanted the Philippians to to see. So we see these problems, all right? So let's look at that. We see the the problems of motives. Then we see the motives themselves. Look at verse 16. Now watch as he unfolds this. The, The one preach Christ of contention, not sincerely. So they won't do it out of sincerity. Supposing to add affliction to my bonds. He said at that time in his setting, they were preaching it uh, with, uh, with contention. And they were trying to add more troubles for the Apostle Paul. Make it harder on him. You know, kind of going out of the way to make it hard on a brother or sister. Don't tell me you ever heard of that happening. Just be quiet. Pray for him. Say, well, they don't believe or agree with how I... Pray for them. Pray for them before you begin to talk bad about them. 
And uh, you'll find that'll go a long way. Some of that'll go away. But here he's, he's explaining these motives. One to add affliction, verse, six, uh, verse uh, 16. If you look at chapter 2, look at chapter 2 with me here in verse 3. He goes on, and oh, I'm jumping, jumping tracks here a little bit. I'm fast forwarding. But look at verse 3 in chapter 2, right in Philippians. Let nothing be done through strife. You mean my preaching, my witnessing, the way I should have an attitude towards... Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. You'll find that pride and vainglory will always be partnered with strife. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. And so that's giving the benefit of the doubt here. And some were doing that, but he, he did identify this. Now watch, first of all, one to add affliction, the one to relieve affliction. Watch the contrast. And this is Paul. This is his, his spiritual depth. Now watch verse 17. Yes, there are preachers. Is when you get around, all they want to talk about is all the negative. What everybody's ever done to them. They go back through each one, each episode. And you're like... You know there's an issue. It's always said, you know, if you got a person that you talk to and all they talk about is the past. And then on top of the past, they talk about all the problems that are in the past. Again, I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer. But you think, what, what, were, were there any good things in the past? Tell me about those. <laughs> Especially if I've heard the old ones a hundred million times. All right, so here, watch the contrast now. Verse 17, but the other of, say it with me, love knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. So they had, they had a, a, a good understanding of what was going on and how God was working. And so they were doing it out of, out of love, one to relieve affliction. So one to add affliction, one to relieve affliction. Let me ask you this. We could ask ourselves this question right here. How do you, what your ministry and how you perceive the church, working out of it, working with it, are you doing it out of affliction to bring affliction and strife, division? Or are you doing it out of love because you love God, number one? Number two, your brothers and sisters, your family, secondary. You love them, but you love God more than them in the, in the fact that you want to please God. Meaning, uh, I think we preach on this Sunday night about how you know when you've prayed enough. I think the second point was when you can handle the disappointment from the brethren. And so if your relationship, vertical relationship is good and solid and healthy, your horizontal relationship with mankind is not going to matter too much. You will be effective. He said, well, I thought I had to be a preacher or a teacher or a missionary. You don't know. You can be just who you are. Just love God. God will make a path and a way for you. And uh, he knows what you can handle. He knows where you should go. He knows how you should go. It's just he needs the yielding to the Holy Spirit because of your will. You have that will that can will to or will not to, all right? So here, he's, we're looking with this motive, this ministry motive. Now, let's get into patience. I think I, have, I do have some time here. Patience. Look at verse 18 and our third point here, patience. All right, before we read verse 18, I want to give the sword drillers another verse. So we looked at Romans chapter 3, verse 23. So you guys, sword drillers ready, the junior are ready. Here we go, Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. If you have it, stand and give me the first couple words. Or you could read it if you'd like, but either way. Everybody help me out here. All right, Naomi's got it again. All right, uh, let's see, verse 8. Give me what you have there. That's it. But God commandeth his love, commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Well, I thought this verse, I love this verse, because you deal with people who say, well, man, I'm trying to clean up my act. I thought I have to get in church before I can get saved. I thought I had to quit sinning before. He says here, but God commendeth his love, not our, his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners. That means God's the one reaching down right where you're at. You could be in a gutter. You could, be, you could be messed up pretty bad. But if you're willing to reach out to God, God will reach down as far as you are. David said in Old Testament, if I make my bed in hell, 
thou art there. That's the long arm of God. He also, with that arm, has the power to sustain you and has uh, the power and the promises to keep you and, and, and to hold you. And he says that while, you were, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Uh, and so we'll have another one here. Hang with me. But Philippians chapter eight, uh, chapter 1, verse 18. Let me get it said right here. Let's look at that. Uh, and I'm going to read it. Philippians, back in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 18. What then? So he's going to form this into a question. Notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth. This is a summary of the verses we read before. Christ is, say it with me, preached. And I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. So we see the patience of dealing with even those that were preaching and ministering with contention. I don't recommend it. The Bible doesn't propagate that. But it's still here and it still happens. You say, what do you do? Shut them down? Don't worry. No, you have to. You pray for them. You pray for them. And it helps you keep yourself in check. Um. I'll move on. I won't make the comment I want to make here. But he says here in verse 18, he says, I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. Let me say this. Christ was preached, whether it was of conflict or opposition uh, and, or per, through persecution, uh, whether it was envy or strife, Christ was preached. Some preached in pretext and some preached in truth. All right. You say, well, man, what happens? That's a good question. I've, had, I've heard this question asked. And it's like, what if you have a preacher who's not living right, being right, acting right, and yet he's still, he's still preaching, he's still giving the gospel, and a person gets saved. Does that person get saved? Yes. When that guy hits the judgment seat of Christ, if that is true, the first part is supposing true. If that work could burn, but that soul that was saved, it's still there. And God says every man's work of what sort it is. So each one of us individually gives an account of the roles that you have. If you're a lady in here, your roles that you've been given in life. So I've never been married. Well, it doesn't matter. It's that role. Well, I've been married. I've been married three times. God, you're going to give an account for that and how you conducted yourself in that role. You say, well, uh, for a man, I've been married. I'm married. I'm, I'm married. I have children. I'm going to give an account of that role that I was placed in as a as a husband, number one. Number two, as a father. You're like, wow. And then ministry. You're going to deal with the works, any work. That's why the Bible says any work of what sort it is. First Corinthians chapter 3. And uh, the sort means in what motive. How did you do it and why did you do it? All right. Okay, so we see here Christ was preached. Some preached in pretext. Some preached in truth. But Paul, lastly, Paul rejoiced. This is a mature position. That is a mature statement here. I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. That's high ground. That's high ground. I, I can't think of a trial that I've been through yet that I thought, man, I am so thankful for this trial. I'm not the other end of the spectrum. Oh, God. Are you really there? You know, I need help, man. This thing is falling apart quickly, and I don't know what to do. You say, you're really? Oh, yes. Because I know falling on the mercies of God, you know, that's what we, that's what we have. But Paul was saying, I will rejoice, even in this affliction, even in this persecution. Rejoice because the furtherance of the gospel is great. He was looking beyond himself. That's what was going on. And he was saying, you need to rejoice even with, with this contention and when not, with not. So uh, that's the lesson tonight. I got one more. I got one more now. Hang with me. Juniors or, or uh, sword drillers. All right. You guys ready? Everybody ready? Here we go. Romans chapter 10, verse 9. Romans 10, verse 9. If you can quote it from memory, you have to quote the whole thing. But stand up if you get it. All right. Uh, Leah or Sarah. I don't. I do the same thing. You say, "You're horrible with that." You ask them; they're grinning because they know. I'll call Esther, Sarah, or Leah, and she'll say Titus, and she'll make mock me a little bit. But Sarah, it is Sarah. All right, Sarah, give me that word there. 
That if, there you go. The Bible says where I called out Romans chapter 10, verse 9. It was real close, Amos, or somebody stood up there. The boys were right on the heels of the girl. Your girls are going to have to pick up your pace. The boys are catching up, that's all I can say. Uh, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth, you say, how does this how does this happen here? You've told us that Christ loves us and, and died for us and extended his love, even while we're yet sinners. Uh, we found that the Bible says in 3.23 that uh, the wages of sin is death. So we understand that death is the proof that we do have a problem. There is a problem. God says, look, I've made a way. It's the cross, uh, and it's through my son, Jesus Christ. He is the sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. So you're going to have to trust what he did on the cross and so he says, people ask, well, how does this happen? Do I get baptized? Well, religion will teach you. Some religion will teach you, yeah, that's what you do. Some, some religion will teach you, no, you've got to take uh, the, the, the Lord's Supper, the wafer or whatever, to get, get this mode of grace, this salvation. That's not what the Bible teaches. I'm going to read a verse and show you. Uh, some people say, well, you've got to join the church. You have to be a member of this church. No, that's wrong. Religion, some religion will teach that. You have to be a member of their church. Uh, you have to believe uh, their stuff uh, are not due. Some of you have to keep the law of Moses. You have to keep the law. Okay, I've heard that. That's not true. It's not what the Bible says. Here's, here's what the Bible says. I'm in Romans chapter 10 and verse 9. He says, That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, that's the center focus of what you need to confess Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. There's, there it is. That's the cross, the death, burial, and resurrection. Thou shalt be saved. I love verse 10 because here's the question. Well, what do you mean? Do I do it with my mouth? Do I do it with my heart? What's it? For with the heart, that's the first part. You're going to believe with your heart. Man believeth unto righteousness. And then with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So, it's the heart, it's the heart that pulls the trigger. Then the mouth says, hey, I got saved, I accepted Christ. And so that's what goes on. Definitely, you can read verse 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, here it is again, shall be saved. And so, very good. Okay, the girls won tonight, but the boys are catching up. I can see it, man, I can see it. They're, they're hungry, they need one. All right, let's all stand up tonight. Thank you for listening uh, for Philippians. You enjoyed it. And we'll try to keep it interesting for the young people as well. Brother Jeff, if you would come and, and Miss Leah will come and play the piano. I'll work on that. But if God's spoken to your heart tonight, mind the Holy Spirit. I'm not, I'm not looking for, I'm not a kind of person that has to see five or six people up front. I want you to listen to the Holy Spirit. He said, well, he's not really saying anything. That's all right. You can ask him. I always like asking God, is there anything in my life that lines up with what I heard tonight with your word that, that, that I need to be focused on or zeroed in on for me? Because each time you can align and correct yourself. This is the moment. 306. 306. Help me see.